Indonesia is white country, a large country, and we uh, have students uh, around the country. Mm. So uh, some side of the country is also uh, have some difficulties to access the internet. Yes, I yes. imagine. How, how, how do they then um, uh, do the online classes? If that's a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, we have two systems. The first is synchronized and the second one is asynchronized. So uh, for the asynchronized one, so we we record our our lecture and then mm -hmm. we have the certain time to discuss together, but in only in a short time. And yes. yeah, we use many kinds of connection like that. For example, we also, sometimes we use the uh, WhatsApp for a small uh, group like that. Yes. 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 Yeah. <laughs> so it is, yes. Yeah. It's. I think it's the same here too. <laughs> we do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Messenger also. Facebook. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, Alita. I, uh, I would like to give the information that the uh, syntax is the webinar uh, regularly, monthly, we conducted the syntax. I see. Monthly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. okay. It's uh, fortunate I met uh, uh, Riza before. Riza? <laughs> <laughs> so he, 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 he invited me. <laughs> I was surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you meet him? <laughs> Just recently online because we were oh, discussing a yes. proposal <laughs> with another colleague. Uh -huh, yeah. <laughs> a month ago, maybe. A month yes. ago. Yeah. <laughs> About that. <laughs> Good. Here we invite also Dr. Jumanto. Hello, Dr. Jumanto. Ya, halo, selamat siang. Ya, selamat siang. Selamat siang. Uh, Pak Jumanto, ya. Yes, selamat siang, Bu Ika. Ya, hantar nomor sangat, ya. Ya. Aleta, good afternoon. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Makanda Umaga. Ah, yes. <laughs> Thank you for magandang hapon. Not yet kami, <laughs> Zerne. Maganda, not yet kami, Zerne. Maganda, maganda umaga, yeah. Okay. Yeah. How do you say it in Indonesia? Uh, selamat siang. Selamat siang. Yeah. Selamat siang. Oh. Selamat siang. Selamat. Also, same in Philippines. Selamat, yeah. Selamat. Also, yeah. selamat. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Terima kasih, thank you. Terima, Terima kasih. kasih. Yeah, yeah. Terima yeah. kasih. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I see Arif. Yeah. Arif is. Hello, Bukuji. Bukuji quit from the zoo. Kuci, apakah ya. menyimak? Bisa, bisa Mas. Ini masih uh, suara saya bisa terdengar. Can you hear this? Bisa, bisa. bisa. Okay. bagus. Ya. Okay, okay. Okay, bagus. Atau pun, Bu, ini baru lihat karena pakai komputer di kantor jadi baru lihat. Ya.
Oke, Mas Gede bisa dimulai. Oke, okay. Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, we cordially invite you to be joined at the webinar today because in a few minutes the event will proceed. Thank you. Assalamualaikum. Uh, welcome to the science and innovative technology discussion today. Uh, respectable to the Vice Rector for Research and Community Service, Universitas Gajah Mada, Mrs. Ika Dewi Ana PSD, Honorable to the Head of Master Program in Fisheries Science, Faculty Agriculture, Universitas Gajah Mada, uh, Dr. Alim Isnan Setio, and Honorable to our Dr. Yes, Dr. Dimanto and which is honorable to all the participants that joining us today. First of all, let's praise our God, the most gracious, the most merciful. Because of Him, we can gather at this opportunity in good condition without any deficiencies. Uh, firstly, uh, I want to introduce myself. My name is Igidu Ferana Putan, wisdom and precious chance for me. And today we have an interesting topic, and the topic is about conservation of marine and fisheries resources. As we know that uh, uh, increasing of human population have resulted in ecosystem. Human activities has resulted in a increased extinction rate of species, which has caused a major decrease in diversity in our the biggest threat or to the environment include overfishing fishing practice sedimentation and pollution next for marine conservation to combine theoretical disciplines such as uh, population biology with practical conservation strategies such as uh, setting up to marine protected area or MPS. So I think MPS or marine conservation can play an important role to marine and fisheries resources. Mainly, uh, conservation will help natural systems stay healthy and in balance. Okay, today we have three speakers and they are uh, Dr. Aleta T. Yiniges for the first speaker and then Dr. Jumanto for the second speaker, and the last speaker is Mrs. Puji Prihatiningsi, MAPPSG. Each speaker will present around 20 to 25 minutes, and after that, I will open for Q&A sections. While the presentation is starting, all the participants must be mute the audio, and all participants can ask direct to the speakers or write in the textbook in the pillow of the monitor especially in room chat uh, or Q&A tab. For your, for your information, this webinar was attended by around uh, 400 participants. Okay, before we start the discussion, there are two welcoming speech. The first is from Mrs. Ikadewi Ana PSD as a vice rector for research and community service development. Untras Kajah Mada for Mrs. Ika Dewi Ana PSD. Time is yours. Yes. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here and to deliver address for this event. Distinguished speakers, guests, and all participants of online seminar series of postgraduate program of fisheries Universitas Gajah Mada. Selamat siang, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, I would like to thank the committee, uh, Dr. Alim Isnan, and also the team, and all the speakers, Professor Aleta Iniges from the University of Philippines, Professor Jumanto from Universitas Gajah Mada, and Ms. Puji Prihatiningsih, uh, Master of Applied Science from 
Karimunjawa National Park. Thank you very much. I also would like to thank the committee for the initiations and management to hold this series of events to disseminate knowledge from our university. Please allow me to address this meeting in Bahasa Indonesia as our national language. We are proud of it as suggested by our government and also to ease us to get the same perspective for the development of the study program. Bapak dan Ibu pembicara, peserta, dan panitia Sintek webinar yang saya hormati, atas nama universitas kami mengucapkan terima kasih uh, atas inisiasi ini. Sebagai negara yang diberi kemuliaan amanah sumber daya kelautan yang paling luas dan berlimpah di dunia, yang membentang dalam tiga zona waktu, Indonesia dan kita semua harus senantiasa mensyukuri karunia dan amanah tersebut. Sumber daya kelautan dan perikanan yang meliputi laut dalam beserta isinya, samudra, 17.000 pulau-pulau kurang lebih ya, kemudian hamparan 86.700 km persegi batu dan terumbu karang, kemudian kawasan pantai dengan mangrovenya yang menghampar 24 1300 km persegi itu semua merupakan kekayaan yang dapat melindungi dan jadi sarana kehidupan bagi 230 juta penduduk Indonesia. Sumber daya tersebut harus mampu kita identifikasi secara saintifik. Kita kembangkan pangkalan datanya menjadi suatu big data sampai ke bahkan mungkin ranah molekuler begitu ya kita kelola dan manfaatkan, serta kita lindungi dan konservasi. Untuk melakukannya bersama-sama, pendidikan SDM masa depan diperlukan untuk menghasilkan pemimpin dalam bidang-bidang spesifik yang terkait dengan hal tersebut. Penelitian juga harus terus dilakukan lintas disiplin melalui kerjasama yang menjunjung kesetaraan, serta belajar dari berbagai sumber dan bekerja sama juga dengan berbagai negara. Riset unggulan UGM yang memiliki dua tema besar yaitu sistem dan material cerdas atau uh, sistem uh, smart uh, smart system and materials untuk menopang bidang agro, kesehatan, energi dan lingkungan serta yang kedua adalah budaya dan transformasi kebudayaan menjadi tema yang pas atau tepat untuk mengembangkan manfaat sumber daya kelautan dan perikanan bagi sebesar-besarnya kesejahteraan masyarakat Indonesia. Lebih daripada itu, pendekatan keilmuan yang lengkap harus diterapkan dalam setiap proses pendidikan, penelitian, dan pengabdian kepada masyarakat atau Tridharma. Pendekatan empiris dan rasional saja, serta positivistik tidak cukup saya kira, Tridharma kita harus memberi ruang untuk mengasah ketajaman sanubari sehingga rahasia ilmu pengetahuan yang sesungguhnya akan membantu kita menemukan ilmu, menghasilkan inovasi-inovasi yang ditujukan untuk kesejahteraan masyarakat. Universitas Gajah Mada sudah merasakan banyak sekali pengalaman bahwa riset-riset yang dikembangkan apabila itu dikembangkan dengan mengasah sanubari Hal tersebut akan menghasilkan manfaat yang berlipat bagi kita semua. Contoh yang paling dekat dengan kita saat ini adalah munculnya Ginos. Profesor Quatriana yang awalnya memaksudkan Ginos tersebut uh, masih terbatas untuk uh, deteksi pemakaian narkoba, lalu untuk deteksi uh, makanan dan produk industri halal begitu. Uh, ternyata kemudian dengan mengasah terus sanubarinya dengan melakukan ya tidak saja menggunakan rasionalitas dan logika tetapi dengan melakukan istilahnya riadoh ya prihatin begitu ya dengan terus menerus melakukan penelitian uh, yang diniatkan dengan dengan bersih begitu akhirnya beliau bisa menghasilkan suatu alat yang ini kemudian dapat dimanfaatkan untuk bidang kesehatan kedokteran. Saya yakin sekali bahwa dalam bidang uh, 
kelautan dan perikanan atau marine and fisheries ini banyak sekali hal-hal yang bisa kita gali bersama, kita identifikasi, kita kelola, kita manfaatkan dan kembangkan dengan bijak dengan melalui pendekatan yang lengkap tadi. Mudah-mudahan pertemuan pada siang hari ini dapat bermanfaat untuk kita semua. And once again, thank you very much for Professor Aleta, Professor Jumanto, and Ibu Puji Prihatiningsi, Master of Applied Science. Mudah-mudahan ilmunya bermanfaat dan demikian sambutan ini disampaikan mewakili Rektor Universitas Gajah Mada. Semoga kegiatan ini bermanfaat untuk kita semua dan semoga Bapak, Ibu, dan kita semua senantiasa sehat dalam lindungan Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala sehingga dapat melanjutkan tugas mendidik, belajar, tugas meneliti, dan mengabdi. Demikian kira-kira dan mohon maaf apabila banyak kekurangan dalam menyampaikan sambutan ini. Nanti Bapak Moderator saya mohon izin untuk mengikuti rapat Research Center setelah ini. Jadi uh, terima kasih atas kesempatannya dan Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you very much for Mrs. Rita Dewi Anna, PhD, for your welcoming speech. And then with full of respect, we are welcoming if you want to stay or leave uh, to this discussion today. Uh, once again, thank you very much for your yeah. 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 Prof. Yeah. Prof. Yeah. Aleta, yeah. I have to attend another meeting. So, thank you very much. I understand. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, for thank you. Okay. For the second welcoming speech, we also invited Dr. Alim Isnan Setio as a head of master program in fishery science, faculty agriculture, University of Yamada for time is your Oke, okay, thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Honorable Dr. Alita, Dr. Jumanto, and Ms. Puji, Master of Applied Science, uh, and also all of the participants, welcome to the webinar number six, uh, our webinar, uh, Syntec webinar. I uh, just only deliver uh, to introduce the our program the magister in uh, fishery science as uh, already uh, said by our vice uh, rector we also will deliver our uh, talk in uh, bahasa indonesia sorry alita Okay, uh, Magister Ilmu Perikanan, Master Program in uh, Fisheries Science. Ini dikelola oleh uh, Departemen uh, Perikanan, Fakultas Pertanian UGM. Uh, kami mempunyai uh, beberapa uh, kerjasama, baik dalam negeri maupun uh, luar negeri. Ini lembaga-lembaga yang uh, bekerja sama dengan uh, kami. Uh, logo logonya ada di sini, walaupun ini uh, ada beberapa logo yang belum kami uh, sertakan. Visinya adalah menjadi uh, suatu program studi yang uh, unggul, kemudian uh, juga berdasarkan Pancasila untuk uh, memajukan kemakmuran uh, bangsa. Kemudian uh, misi uh, Master in Fisheries Science adalah pertama adalah melaksanakan riset Based Educational Activity. Sorry. Kemudian yang kedua adalah melaksanakan uh, research. Uh, yang ketiga adalah uh, membangun national and international partnership. Kemudian yang ke uh, secara aktif berpartisipasi dalam pembangunan uh, perikanan dan juga termasuk juga manajemen sumber daya akuatik. 
dan juga uh, yang terakhir adalah ingin menjadi suatu uh, sentral informasi untuk uh, fisheries dan aquaculture termasuk uh, dalam hal industri pengolahan uh, hasil perikanan. Profil lulusan kami adalah uh, pertama bisa meng juga mempublikasikan penelitian-penelitian, kemudian juga bisa uh, menemukan suatu problem solving atas berbagai permasalahan yang ada di dunia uh, perikanan, kemudian juga bisa memanage, uh, mengelola, dan uh, mengembangkan uh, penelitian-penelitian yang ada adalah whole structure kurikulum kita walaupun eh, sekarang juga sudah agak eh, berubah akan tapi untuk semester ini dan semester eh, depan mungkin eh, masih menggunakan ini akan tapi kita memproyeksikan bahwa segera kita akan menggunakan kurikulum yang baru eh, master di eh, UGM harus menuruh eh, kredit yang terdiri dari teori dan kemudian seminar dan juga ada tesis. Kami mempunyai tiga fokus utama yaitu aquaculture, kemudian fisheries resources management dan juga fish processing technology. Fasilitas yang ada yang kami kelola adalah ada dikelompokkan jadi teaching and learning research and community development Facilities yang terdiri dari uh, laboratorium, research station, kemudian ada fish processing, cold storage, kemudian kita juga mempunyai agricultural learning center, kemudian juga online learning management uh, system. Kemudian kita juga mengelola berbagai macam equipment yang ada di laboratorium dan juga di ada, ada di research station. Library semuanya sudah uh, online, Kemudian juga Wi-Fi, kita mempunyai uh, Wi-Fi yang sudah mencakup ke semua uh, ruangan, baik itu laboratori maupun ruangan ruangan mahasiswa, termasuk uh, juga ada working place, itu juga sudah ada Wi-Fi-nya. Nah, uh, walaupun demikian, tadi sudah ada di sini Agricultural Learning Center, kita juga mempunyai integrated uh, laboratory, yaitu Agro-Tropical Learning Center. Kemudian juga uh, mahasiswa-mahasiswa kami juga mempunyai akses yang penuh terhadap laboratorium-laboratorium yang ada di uh, UGM, lintas uh, fakultas. Ini teaching dan uh, learning metodenya. Jadi uh, kita uh, melakukan um, dua uh, program, yaitu program reguler, reguler dan fast track yang ini dalam masuk dalam by course kemudian juga uh, melaksanakan program uh, by research keduanya nanti uh, bisa uh, mendapatkan master of uh, science kemudian uh, learning method terdiri dari lecture kemudian uh, seminar juga presentation assignment kemudian juga ada project mini project maupun site visit uh, dan juga ada nantinya uh, pengabdian pada masyarakat. Contoh misalnya saja aktivitas-aktivitas uh, kita bisa dilihat di web kami. Kemudian ini adalah beberapa aktivitas uh, mahasiswa, training kita setiap uh, tahun kita melakukan training-training uh, yang uh, menghadirkan ekspert-ekspert uh, dari uh, luar negeri. Juga kita mengirimkan mahasiswa-mahasiswa bergabung dengan mahasiswa-mahasiswa secara internasional untuk melaksanakan aktivitas-aktivitas yang ada hubungannya dengan fisheries and aquaculture. Ini adalah kunjungan dari Erasmus Plus di UGM. Demikian. Kemudian seperti yang kita saat ini lakukan, kita melakukan sintek ini karena dalam masa pandemi COVID, kemudian kita mengembangkan suatu metode, suatu media untuk saling mengenal dan juga saling share knowledge dan juga science. 
sehingga uh, kita membuat uh, sintek ini science and innovative technology webinar. Biasiswa yang dapat digunakan uh, semua biasiswa secara nasional bisa dimanfaatkan di uh, magister kami. Kemudian hmm. secara spesifik untuk uh, fast track ini uh, Fakultas Pertanian juga memberikan uh, scholarship memberikan biasiswa kepada mahasiswa-mahasiswa uh, fast track. Baik, demikian ini memperkenalkan magister kami. Semoga nanti ada mungkin mahasiswa-mahasiswa atau mungkin rekan-rekan dan juga mungkin kenalan-kenalan dan juga mungkin family bisa bergabung dengan kami. Semoga kita berjumpa di magister ilmu perikanan. Terima kasih. Oke. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for Dr. Ali Mistan Setio for your presentation about master program in fishery science at Universitas Gadjah Mada. Um, I think, uh, and I think everyone cannot wait to hear the presentation from the first speaker. So I will give, give the time to the first speaker, Dr. Aleta Tuyinijes, and she will present about hazard detection and mitigation tools for algal blooms in a changing marine environment. Dr. Aleta Tijinjes is a, an associate professor uh, at the Marine Science Institute, University of Philippines in Diliman, uh, where she heads the lab biological oceanography and modeling of ecosystems. She already obtained her PhD from the Rosenstiel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science, University of Miami in Florida, with the support of Fulbright and Matek Scholarship. Uh, she uses an arsenal of file, uh, laboratory, and compute, computer modeling approaches to investigate the potential effect of environmental conditions. There are including anthropogenic activities and uh, I think a climate change on the base of the marine food web and how this can impact in the Philippine fisheries, particularly of the occurrence of harmful algal blooms. Time is sure. Oh. Is it? Sorry. Uh, can I can I go ahead already? Or it's it's okay to go ahead. Yes, yes, please. Oh, okay. Sorry, I yeah, the sound one couldn't hear it for a bit. Uh, is I will share the screen and. Is uh, um, the screen okay? In the my, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, yes. very okay. clear. Thank you, thank yeah. you, thank you. Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank uh, you for the opportunity to to uh, be here and share some of the research that we've been doing on harmful algal blooms. And uh, Thank you um, for the uh, everyone here, for the officials, the faculty, and students of the University of Gajamada, and the uh, organizers of this SINPEC webinar series, and the other guest speakers, and of course the many participants. So uh, I hope that uh, I can share some of the um, studies and uh, initiate uh, discussions on on uh, the work that we've been doing, and possibly your own work as well. So oh, this, this title, the Hazard Detection and Mitigation Tools for Algal Blooms in a Changing Marine Environment is actually the title of the program, uh, HAB program that we are undertaking currently and that I'm also leading. So in the Philippines, as I'm sure is very similar to Indonesia, our fisheries is a very important source of food and livelihood. And 
uh, and uh, Philippines is one of those uh, in the uh, top countries con contributing to global aquaculture production for fish, crustaceans, and mollusks. And again, as, uh, similar to what's the pattern, what the pattern is globally and in many countries, aquaculture is increasing in terms of contribution to the fisheries. And currently, there's, I think, more than 50% of uh, the country's fisheries comes from aquaculture now versus wild caught fisheries, whether municipal or commercial. And some of the top mariculture products, apart from seaweed, are the milkfish, the oysters, and the mussels. Unfortunately, these uh, mariculture products and industries are very much impacted by harmful algal blooms in the country, where halves is the rapid growth or accumulation, so-called blooms, of phytoplankton. And they're considered harmful if there's uh, the phytoplankton species that blooms has toxin. And so the toxin accumulates through the food, food chain and potentially affect us. Also, uh, when the uh, blooms cause depletion in oxygen in the water column, uh, which can lead to fish kills or other uh, organisms being killed. Or even uh, sometimes these blooms have mechanical impacts where the organisms uh, can cause fish kills through mechanical means. And the Philippines is one of those very much affected by HAPS within, uh, within just uh, Asia and Southeast Asia, uh, apart from also Malaysia. We have one of the highest uh, paralytic shellfish poisoning cases in the country, uh, one type of toxic algal bloom. And we experience, we can experience large economic losses from fish kills, uh, and uh, toxic blooms as well, ranging from tens to hundreds of millions of pesos in one event only. And of course, that means there are lots of um, losses for potential for exports of these sorts of fisheries products. And of course, more importantly as well, is the cost, um, the impact on the livelihood of coastal communities and also as a direct food source for thousands of fisher folk all around the country. The harmful algal blooms in the Philippines uh, has been increasing at least in the early uh, past decades. So we looked into the trend in HABs in the Philippines uh, using a long-term record from based on shellfish harvest bans or shellfish bulletins issued by our regulatory institution on fisheries, the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources or BIFAR. So uh, during the time when HABS was being recognized and probably contributed to this pattern, there was a steep in increase in the number of shellfish ban advisories in the 80s to the 90s, late 90s. Uh, and then eventually this stabilized towards the early 2000s to about 18.6 or around you know, 19 shellfish advisories per year all around the country. And currently there doesn't seem to be any trend towards an increase. So at least uh, it's about a little lower than the past 2000s. And but this is, uh, this is also reflected in a similar pattern in, the, in terms of the duration of the shellfish ban. So how long are the closures for shellfish harvest in the different areas around the country with the shellfish advisories? So it's uh, increased earlier and then has uh, decreased now a bit uh, in the uh, recent years, but it's still significant. I mean, 120, six days in a year where, where you have uh, bans within the country. Uh, although there, we don't see a distinct increase in the number of events 
what we do see is that there is an increase in the number of sites that are affected in the country. So um, in the 1980s to late 1990s, two new sites were added every year in terms of new hub affected areas uh, in the country. Recently, it's gone down to about one new site um, every two years. Um, hopefully this can go down even more, but um, still there's more, you know, more sites that are being affected per year. And recently we haven't looked into the new data now. Just last year, there were also new sites that uh, at least two or three new sites that I heard of uh, or were recorded to have, uh, have events. The other um, difficulty with harmful algal blooms is it can be very temporally variable. So these, this figure shows um, uh, different sites in a particular region in the country where the record for the shellfish bands are considered. So the black lines or the black uh, areas represent clear areas, no shellfish band, and then the red areas represent the start of a shellfish band and the continuation of shellfish bands are the blue areas. So in general, you can see that it can be quite um, in, in per site, you can have shellfish bands occurring and then there's a long period, this, this is in um, months through uh, the tens of years. So you can have many years where there's no have occurring, but then suddenly, uh, it will occur again and then disappear and then occur again and so on. So it can be um, uh, challenging to, to know when the hub would happen in a site and especially when we're affected in many areas. So this shows now the uh, where paralytic shellfish toxic blooms occur in different parts of the country. And as you can see, there's a lot of areas, mostly embayments where primarily this species, Spirodinium bahamense, a toxic dinoflagellate, uh, occurs and is able to bloom. So th those are the red dots, the first recorded or historically observed uh, bloom of Spirodinium and hab event and toxic hab event in the country occurred here in this area and from there has spread out to different parts of the Philippines. And also, uh, now we also see the there's Alexandrium species that bloom in some areas like here in Manila Bay and also in uh, uh, Bohol and the eastern, some of the eastern parts of the Philippines and here in Palawan. And then also another uh, paralytic shellfish toxic species called Gymnodinium catenatum. So, Again, these are uh, some of the toxic species that we've observed in pyridinium being the most dominant one. Uh, recently, we've had uh, a report of uh, toxin from event from Sudonitskia, which is a diatom. So this is you and I think um, we still need to get a better handle on some of the new species that we're seeing blooming. So this is under the microscope of uh, recent last year or last two years ago, a bloom in uh, in uh, internal seas where there was a mix of Alexandrium and Pyridinium in, in an area. Another uh, toxic bloom that we're concerned about is from Cigotera fish poisoning. So this is from benthic dinoflagellates, uh, and um, and and these then affect the more on the uh, um, coastal habitat like coral reefs and seagrass beds uh, species like your grouper, snapper, and barracuda, the higher predators which have uh, ac accumulate the toxin. So these are cases of the actual poisoning, the number of people that have been affected through historically in the country. And um, we need to get a better handle on this, actually. And then, of course, the, on the fish scale side, um, in, especially in, in the big mariculture area of the Philippines up north, these have been 
quite active <laughs> in di different species in fish kill events. The, one of the first big ones is Porocentro minimo, and then uh, you have other diatoms and flagellates. And more recent ones is this uh, smaller dinoflagellate called Takayama that's been causing fish kill events uh, recently. So again, some new species coming in, or maybe that we're now we're more um, observant about. So uh, the PAB program that we're doing, the objectives, the main uh, objective is that we want to be able to help answer the challenges in monitoring and managing the very variable and large area or expansive hubs that our country experiences through the development of means for more rapid and increased scale of detection of algal blooms and developing robust early warning systems. So hopefully this would allow for more proactive mitigation and enhanced understanding of HABs, of course. The framework of the program is uh, you have the, the research or studies and development of tools for HAB detection uh, and also, of course, understanding the dynamics of the hubs that are occurring, which are fed into an informatic system. And these help to come up with a hub early warning system, which is to develop together with stakeholders or partners on the ground. And that this approach, we hope that uh, we can ad help address the hub issues through strong partnerships between government agencies concerned, us, the academe, and also the stakeholders like the fisher folk and the shellfish or fish farmers. And, and the idea is that we're really harnessing synergies and the different capabilities to enhance understanding of hubs and the development of these early warning mitigation and management systems. Uh, so, we the, we've um, for these different sites that we we were looking into for the program, we've come up with what we call a, a partnership that we call Coasts or the Community Alliance for the Sustainability of Our Threatened Seas. And the study sites that we were looking at, so these are a lot of the sites that have been or are affected by HAB in the country. We are focused on four. Ones the Bulinao, the northern uh, northwestern area, Bulinao, and in Pagasinan, here in Palawan, here in Capiz, and here in Summer Lake. And they also experience different types of hubs and have different histories of hubs. So, this is the framework that we're using to develop the hub early learning system. It's composed of four components. So, the first is hub risk knowledge, where we want to understand the risk of the toxic bloom. So uh, in the fish kills, the patterns, the trends, uh, risk maps and data available regarding HAB events, and even identifying potential needs for prevention or control. And the second part is monitoring and warning service, where we're fo this focuses on detecting monitoring of the HAB organisms, what are the relevant parameters uh, for hubs such, uh, you, that we can obtain through sensors and field activities? These would be the basis to develop the forecasting models or any models to understand the dynamics and uh, having an accurate and timely analysis assessment and warning generation mechanism. And then dissemination and communication essentially is getting warnings uh, or information to the sectors uh, most involved or at risk. And of course, it's not just getting that information to them, but uh, ensuring that they understand what those warnings or messages uh, mean. So that includes the clarity and usability of the warning information and uh, potentially if, uh, aid in mitigating HAB impacts. And then lastly, the response capability is uh, harnessing the local capacities and knowledge on hubs and how they can respond to these hub events. So these would include prepar preparing and their 
responses to the warnings in uh, actual HAB events. So I'll go through each of those components, uh, the activities that we've done and how they contribute to those four components. So the first for HAB risk knowledge essentially is we've uh, put up a historical and updated database for HAB sites. And uh, we've, because there's a lot of data, but they're quite scattered. So different institutions, different um, uh, academic units or labs have that. So here we tried to pull what was available already together historically and in currently and put this in a standardized format so that they can be analyzed better for patterns and trends. And an important part as well of the HAG risk knowledge are going to the stakeholders, the communities who are at risk, knowing uh, who they are, what their uh, social demographic information are, and also uh, obtaining from them their observations regarding HAB events, because of course they, they've been, uh, this is an important part of their livelihood, shellfish um, farming, fish farming, and fisheries in general. So they're the ones who are daily uh, involved day to day in these areas and have an idea on what happens during HAB events. So we also try to extract that sort of community knowledge in, in our um, in the program. And that's why we did participatory risk assessments. And part of the program I work with uh, have uh, social scientists. The, the other component is monitoring and warning service. So one aspect is how to obtain environmental information through sensors. And of course, ideally you have real time continuous, reliable water quality monitoring. And um, we have, uh, we are developing and testing locally developed low cost sensors and are called SensePack. And I, I collaborate with a physicist and engineer on this from the, same, from the University of the Philippines as well. And the idea is to have this modular design um, of the electronics with the sensors module, sensor inputs, uh, the battery, and uh, and we also have a chlorophyll sensor. So it measures temperature, salinity, pH, dissolved oxygen, and chlorophyll. Uh, and an important aspect is for the automation is having telemetry capability that would transmit from areas to a station into the database directly. So we've been trying this out. We're still um, prototypes testing this and um, uh, adjusting based on our field observations. And so from the field, the, the sensor would, would uh, put in the data online um, and hopefully we can get that running uh, sooner than later. And, the idea as well is that why it's low cost because as I'm sure you're aware of, there's uh, many sensors out there commercially available, but they can be very expensive, especially if you include um, fluorescence and the telemetry capability. So uh, if uh, in, uh, deploying these sorts of instruments in the field here in the Philippines, uh, the most likely thing that will happen is that they will be lost or they will be stolen. So uh, part of our idea is to have it low cost. So it's less, um, hurt. <laughs> it hurts less if you lose it, but also we're engaging the communities so that they can help us monitor and safeguard these instruments. So the other, um, the other, the other, uh, Part of the monitoring warning service is, uh, of course, we're monitoring the, the phytoplankton and cells, have species and, and the toxins as, as well. And we're attempting to look into the, the usability of what's called, what we call BAT or biotoxin absorption toxin tracking. Uh, this shows you the simple BAT where there's a, there's a uh, container with a mesh screen and the 
adsorption, the resin itself is like this tea bag that's inside it and it can absorb uh, toxin from the water column. So instead of shellfish, using shellfish, which can be quite variable depending on the tissue, depending on the physiology, um, we, and we're looking into this bat and, and also comparing different methods on using HPLC and RBA for the bat versus shellfish comparison of the toxins. And part of the uh, monitoring and warning is also through models. So we have a remotely sensed uh, model that's developed by colleagues, Aldrin Almo and Laura David. And this is called CHABS or the Semi-Automated Harmful Algal Bloom Detection System. And it's, uh, it's uh, based essentially on chlorophyll A anomalies with thresholds for different areas. Uh, so this provides a kind of a large scale synopsis on anomalies around the country, which could initially warn regulators and the community on potential blooms, but since we don't know what species it is, what, um, and of course there are certain limitations through satellite imagery, uh, at, le at least it will just provide some sort of um, warning that, hey, maybe we should monitor more often now uh, compared to before if there's an anomaly occurring in a particular area. Apart from uh, remotely sensed models that are larger scale, we're also, um, we've also been um, developing models that are site specific for the toxic blooms and fish kills. So this one is a, a paper in progress where we've uh, analyze potential connections between hub sites within the internal seas. So these are sites that have been affected by hubs for many years and um, they have different occurrences. So we were assessing in terms of circulation pattern and connection, how likely certain sites can be used as indicator sites for hubs. And also uh, we use machine learning for another site uh, where we take in the data from sensors and have a trained machine learning model that can output probabilities of shellfish bands or fish kills in the site. Um, we need, when the sensors are ready, we're, we'll be validating these more uh, on site. And put this all together, essentially we have the um, Hub Hub, which is the informatic system where you have all the database information, the standardized database uh, put in by partners, with historical ones, and then information from sensors and the community, the government and other academe and uh, partners um, that would input into the computer models and provide information and alerts. So this is the current um, uh, hub, hub site interface. This is, uh, uh, it's not yet public, but we hope to get this out in a few months time. And then the dis dissemination communication part is uh, this one we will still need to discuss more with our industry partners and community partners um, and government agency partners. What are, what are the appropriate uh, media and language of communication to disseminate the information that we get? Um, especially when it gets to the coastal communities who don't necessarily actually have strong internet access. Uh, how will the modes of communication going to be, in, uh, especially if we want them to be effective and how would they understand the warnings um, for, that we provide? Lastly, re response capacity. So as I mentioned, we've been working with the coastal communities, the fisher folk, and uh, uh, to, to understand what the risks that they have in hubs, but also uh, helping them to, to conduct action plans or to come up with community action plans, wherein despite, uh, uh, well, 
they know or there's a lot of these areas that ha have um, known histories already of recurrent harmful algal blooms. So knowing this and without waiting for events like hubs to keep on occurring, what can they uh, actually do early on in terms of minimizing their risks to these hub events? And uh, this is part education awareness and also partly uh, empowering or mobilizing the, the communities in order to, to um, uh, move with their action plans. So uh, essentially that's uh, uh, what we've developed so far for these, this actually it's people-centered HAB early warning system for those different components. And uh, we are tying up a lot of things still together because of uh, many different components that are involved in this uh, program. So I would like to acknowledge our uh, Department of Science and Technology, the Picard, which is the main funder of this program. And of course, our partners from the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources in different regions of the country and lo local government units and the state universities, the academic partners in different areas uh, and my many research collaborators who are involved in the program from different oceanographers, chemists and uh, physicists and social scientists in my lab. So thank you. Uh, okay, thank you very much uh, for Dr. Aleta for your presentation. I think it's very important and very nice presentation. Once again, thank you, Dr. Aleta. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Information for all the participants. If you have any questions, you can write in the textbook or in the pillow of the monitor, especially in room chat or here in the tab. And now we will continue to the second speaker, Dr. Jumanto. He will deliver about fish resources conservation in Yogyakarta. Dr. Jumanto is a lecturer at the Fisheries Department, Faculty of Agriculture, Universitas Gajah Mada. And now he heads of Management and Aquatic Resources Study Program in his department. He, he already obtained his doctoral degree from the Institute of Marine and Biology, University of Ehime, Japan and focusing on conservation and management fisheries resources. Dr. Jumanto already has a lot of experience about conservation. For Dr. Jumanto, time is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Ibu Ika Dewiana, Dr. Alim, uh, Dr. Alita Nikwes, also uh, Ibu Puji uh, and uh, all participants. Thank you very much for your attention. And um, I will share my screen. Okay. okay. This uh, uh, as the appointment to me that I would like present the topic about the diversity of fish species in Indonesia. Even though mostly participants from Indonesia, but this is the international seminar, so I will, I will talk in English, sorry. Uh, let me start and, okay, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. <clears throat> As uh, already introduced about me, that uh, I work in the Department of History, Faculty of Gajah Mada University. And this evening, I would like to talk about the conservation of fish, uh, fish resource in Yogyakarta. And let's move on. Uh, the topic I would like to talk today is about uh, introduction. Then I will continue to the diversity of fish species. Uh, 
the three to fish diversity. Next, I would like to talk about the conservation and challenges and protection of fish species in the last. And as we know, this is uh, in the right side, the panel side is uh, the Central Sabah and Yogyakarta, and the below one is the Yogyakarta, that the area uh, that I have already researched some uh, doing research in Yogyakarta, and the central is in the media is uh, the photograph about the uh, invasive species that this is uh, planned to be transferred uh, between um, city and also between countries. Let's move on to the first. Uh, as we know that the total number of species, fish species in the world is around 28,000 species. That is from the Nelson 2006. And now in uh, Yogyakarta, in Indonesia, the freshwaters, uh, the total fish in, in, in Indonesia is mostly around 4,782 species. And all of them uh, from the freshwaters around 1,243. And about this, uh, we do not talk about the endemic and returns. And this species is distributed uh, between the, and the this red panel about the, <clears throat> um, what's next? We, but in the western side is um, about the the right uh, and oh, sorry we don't see this about the Wallace line sorry <laughs> we don't see it here uh, Wallace line in the right side and the middle is about a uh, bit in the middle and the east is here about the Weber line. And so mostly species is diverse in the western, uh, in the west uh, between the Wallace lines, and a little is in the middle, is mostly in from the uh, Sulawesi, and we will talk about in the west. Uh, let's move on, and <clears throat> this is uh, the distribution of fish species, uh, the freshwater species, in Java around 138, then in Sumatra, around 222, and Kalimantan, around 394 species. And this is uh, most species this, uh, distributed in uh, Kalimantan because this, the, uh, there are a lot of uh, species that make species as so many species here. And <clears throat> This species is mostly distributed from the lower area until the from the mountain. Uh, let's see, all mountain from the mountain until the lower area. And this is um, the ecosystem of Yogyakarta. Let's move to Yogyakarta. That's uh, as you know, and the this is the map of showing of you to the map of Yogyakarta. There are two uh, watersheds. Um, call Opa Ayo water set in the eastern and the um, <clears throat> Morocco water set in the western area. Uh, Yogyakarta has fresh water because if on Morocco, Opa Ayo in the eastern that can, um, running from the mountain until the um, coastal area that this Opa River is one of the tributary, which is in the eastern part, while in the western part is a Proko uh, water patch. For the Opa River, the length is approximately 61 kilometers. So this is uh, very short. That uh, during the rainy season like this one, when the area of the mountain area is raining, then the water will move to the southern in the equal stars and will drain around six hours. So because it's very, uh, the bus is the steep and very short. The river is like 61 uh, kilometers, then the water from here in the central, then uh, followed in the Sleman Regency and 
throw to the bundle recently. The Opa River is uh, used for many purpose for drinking water, <coughs> irrigation, animal husbandry, fishing, recreation, household waste, household waste disposal, also others such as uh, home industries. Next, uh, this is I show you the uh, mostly tributaries, river tributaries in Yogyakarta. In the upper photograph, mostly the steepest, uh, steepest and the with running, uh, high running flow rates of waters. In the middle is mostly in for the agriculture, and the bottom, the water is uh, in the Close to in, in the Pendle area, mostly the river is very uh, deep and the so slow running waters. And this is three, uh, the uh, Yogyakarta maps. Yeah. And for the uh, in the left side, uh, I show you the length of the river, mostly in Kindle. Kindle here uh, is the name of rivers, is this area. Yeah, this area that we. I will talk much about this area. Then Opa Rivers is from Kendal until uh, coastal area. Then Winonga Rivers is here, Winonga Rivers. Then Chode Rivers, the length is around 30 kilometer. Then Kacahong. And also Tambak Bayan Rivers, uh, around 20 kilometers here. I will talk next year. And Bedok Rivers around 40 kilometer, Oyo this total, and Proko refers. <clears throat> uh, let's move on. And this is I saw the distribution of the dam. Uh, so we call in Indonesia is Mbung, is a reservoir, small reservoir. Mbung is a reservoir for, uh, the purpose is for agriculture. And here is Mostly the dams, so many of them here, small. And yeah, the red is about the moon. And the bottom is about the number of dams in Sleman was around 20, Bantul around 69 them, And Kulon Broko is around seven them, And Gunung Kitul is so many, 106. And uh, all of them, the volume is mostly in uh, in Kulon Proko, because here uh, there is one reservoir in Kulon Proko. Here uh, we have uh, in Kulon Proko have one reservoir named um, Temong Reservoir. So here uh, the number of fish species mostly in Jawa. In Jawa is mostly around 150, and I don't know exactly uh, how many species in Yogyakarta, and I. Think around 50 to 80 species. Uh, there, you know, uh, there is no information about the exact number of fish species in Yogyakarta. Yeah. Then, and this is tricky and, and challenges for us to uh, study how many species distributed in in Yogyakarta, especially and in Java, totally how many species. It is very interesting to study. Let's move on to the. Uh, <clears throat> at the most important fisheries in, in the river ecosystem in Yogyakarta is mostly for uh, we can use biological indicator uh, environment that if the river still a lot of fish and other aquatic organisms, it means that the environment is still in good condition. So if the uh, river only found uh, we call sapu-sapu feces, <laughs> that fish uh, can adapt it in the bad area, uh, in bad condition. So this condition is uh, very um, dangerous. It means that the uh, river uh, in the environment is too bad. So fish can be used as biological indicators as environment. And the second one is cheap protein source for local community in the red side here. I saw you about the uh, small restaurant that sell about the uh, cheap fish. We call water, uh, 
uh, here. And the rats here are also the, so many people of going fishing. Yeah, uh, going fishing. Also, the bottom one here is uh, some people fish in the reservoirs. And the third is fish in the river, also in the reservoir is used for recurrent fishing. Yeah, for recurrent fisheries, it means that they can fish, they can um, cut the fish by some uh, some uh, fish, uh, some fishing gears. And also the four is provide ornamental fish for hobbies. As we know that some species sell by um, hobbies or some people for hobbies and mostly is coming from the fresh waters. Yeah. And the fourth is source for biological diversity for connected rivers. And we will talk next this uh, very interesting topic. And others, uh, important fish such as for um, hobbies, yeah, that uh, there are some species that uh, very like fighting. So some uh, people use these fishes to get uh, money to fight the fish. Next, uh, I will talk about the study in this area, in three areas. Uh, the, the upper one here is the Kendall area, we will talk. Uh, and the second area in the middle we call is the upper part in the middle part of uh, Yogyakarta, uh, of Opa Oyo water set. And the bottom one here is the lower part of uh, Opa Oyo water sets. We do research this area yeah, in the upstream, middle, and the stream in the water set using some uh, fishing gears that can collect sample fish, uh, non-selective. It means that all fish that habitat in this area can be collected by this uh, fishing gears. Yeah. <clears throat> Next, uh, this is the area in the upper tier I talk to you that in the Kindle area, Kindle area here, we found only 20, uh, 12 species, yeah, 12 species running from, uh, and most species is, the species can adapt by uh, running uh, flow water speed and this uh, flow uh, high uh, speed of flowing waters. And use mostly is small. And the dominated is in here, we collect the bird logs, Nemasulus uh, fasciastus, or in Indonesia we call, uh, in Bahasa we call Ucheng, this one is the species, the most dominant, the small, uh, they can uh, stay in the uh, high speed water flows. Yeah. And the second one is Poesilia here, in Kupi. Yes. This small fish, yeah. so mostly small fish uh, can stay in the upper uh, area of general rivers. Yeah. This is in the upper area, and next uh, in the bottom one here is the sample fish that we collected. Yeah. And next uh, is in the middle area here. We collect uh, at this time round. 21, uh, 21 species of fish uh, of species. And mostly the, uh, the dominant species, mostly is tilapia, yeah. Oricromis uh, niloticus, nail tilapia, or in Bahasa is mujair. Uh, some some um, people mix together, yeah. Uh, tilapia, yeah, ni, uh, mujair onila. Yeah. Um, this is the most dominant. And the second is rabura, yeah, rasbura, this uh, silver rasbura we call ikan water bari. And this ikan water bari already uh, spawned by colleagues from uh, the faculty of biology. So compared to the uh, upper area, in the middle area is the number of species almost doubling, almost twice. Yeah. So uh, the down area, yeah, uh, by reducing the area, the number of fish species increased twice. Yeah. 
and the dominant species also the difference. And this area a little bigger compared to the uh, in the upper area. <clears throat> Next, this uh, I show you in the bottom area here. Uh, in the bottom area, uh, in the lower part. Sorry, in the so I call in this is the upper part, middle part, and the lower parts of the Opa Oyo River. And in this area, we get around twenty, uh, around thirty-five species, yeah, around twenty-five species. And the most dominant species is Mas Tarsius marginatus. Yeah, the species is uh, we call ikan kepek in Bahasa. Yeah, this is uh, most dominant. The second one still uh, still okay. The second one is still Raspora argyrinitora otobari. Uh, this is the most dominant. So. The raspora dominant from the middle to the bottom part, uh, while the uh, master mustachulus marginatus is dominant in the bottom one here. Or you can compare is dominant here. And if we uh, compare to the middle area and the upper area, so from the upper area here. The number of species increased three times, uh, while from the middle area will increase one half times here. Yeah, if he compares, because here we found 21 in the second, in the lower one, we got uh, 35 species. Interestingly, in the lower part here, uh, we collect also some species that. Um, migrates from the seawater to breastwater here, here. And also some species only visit in the several time or in the short time, yeah, like Sarangiti here. And also other species. Uh, Mukil also we found here that they um, uh, goes to the brackish water uh, sometime until fresh water. Interesting only, I found that the species in the upper one is very limited species, Mastectosius, yeah. Uh, the number is very limited here, uh, but I still found uh, the species, yeah. We, some species we found only in the uh, bottom area here, in the uh, lower area here. Okay. And next, about the biodiversity uh, loss uh, in the e river ecosystem will implicate for the provision of fisheries resource. If the fish species uh, disappear from the river, so it means that may, uh, community will uh, not uh, will get uh, with difficult to get the fishes from the rivers. Also, the second is the Habitat or uh, biotic organisms that mostly found uh, get the fish as the prey. And uh, there is some species uh, serve as the oxygen services. So, how to uh, overcome this is um, uh, why this is can um, occur that fish will, can, will disappear in the rivers is mostly that the decreasing of fish species mostly um, by unsuitable fishing some some part is uh, uh, used uh, using by uh, unsuitable fishing gear then the second is habitat loss uh, changing the next is about the introduction of new species or uh, exotic species and the fourth is about the pollution and global climate change. I will talk about the pollution next. And also about the human intervention in forest water ecosystem by introducing uh, invasive fish species. So next to uh, move to the um, treat, treat to diversities. Yeah. 
trees to diversity, the sums of the trees to diversity include unsuitable fishing gear. Here in the uh, red parts, I show you how some fishermen, uh, maybe some hobbies, I don't talk some fishermen, but some hobbies, collect the fish using uh, standing electric, yeah, standing electric that uh, they made by their shelf and because the material is very cheaper, so this is very easy to uh, mix uh, equipment. And so this uh, fishing gear is will reduce the fish community in the river system because all fish species almost uh, die when stand with electric. Yeah, so some fishermen use fishing gear that is not environmentally friendly to get their fish cat, and this in fact will decrease of the fish species population in the rivers. Uh, even though during two hours in the uh, in the upper area, they can collect around half kilogram of the feces, but the impact to the fish population is uh, will make the populace, fish population will decrease rapidly. Next about the habitat loss and change due to natural disaster. This is uh, my research that this river condition. This is uh, about 2009, before uh, Mount Merapi eruption. You see, this is the very uh, nice uh, environment. And the middle is the feces that I found, uh, mostly this uh, from cyprinids. And the right side, and the right side is uh, after the eruption of Mount Merapi. So this river um, erupted and burned around maybe around 10 meter more, uh, the tip of the sand that's uh, covered this river. So we can imagine all fish species that habitat in this area uh, lost and die. Yeah. So uh, we don't know, still we don't know after the river get back, how the fish can get here. Maybe uh, in my imagine that they come from the connected rivers. Yeah. So the eruption of Mount Merapi caused the upper reach of river and several tributaries in the upper water set to bury it by lava, sand, gravel, and rocks that make all fish species and um, add, uh, what, uh, aquatic biotic, uh, the aquatic biotic here is uh, lost. Next, about uh, introduction of new species. This also the challenges to the um, Conservations, yeah. In same in Sermo Reservoir, we talk in Sermo Reservoirs, the red devil began exist in around 2004. In here, the left button one is about the red devil, yeah. Since then, the population has been very dominant and the diversity fish has decreased, causing fishermen has uh, harvest to decline and community welfare has also decreased. Why this occurred? Because the red devil here, the size is very small, then the bone is very hard and, and makes it uh, unpalatable. Yeah. Uh, in fact, is the other population like tilapia uh, at the cichlids uh, decreased their population. Before 2004, the population of uh, tilapia nilotica or cichlids on El tilapia is the most dominant around uh, 84%. And now maybe around four years ago when I was collect sample there, the dominant, the um, tilapia population around less than 20%, while um, red devil area, the left side is around 70%. So you can imagine that by changing the by introducing on this fish, the population uh, changes fairly. And the right side up for where, uh, 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 in the up, upper part, this is the sum, sample that we have um, sampling the fish using gill net. Uh, we get mostly 
um, red devil here. And another is about the Colossomahia the species we call in Bahasa is bawang. This also makes some species, uh, if we call, collect this from the river, it means that uh, introducing this species will very uh, dangerous because it can reduce the population of the species from the rivers. Next, uh, about the polar pollution and global climate change. Uh, uh, this is a figure that I found from my friend that the photograph showing the uh, garbage uh, from the industry that's um, pure uh, to the rivers and mix is mixed with pollution. Yeah? So some waste from home industries and household dispose the waste directly into the river, into the river but this without treatment. So it should be a small industry, a home industry, and others make treatment their uh, garbage on their waste before release to the rivers. Yeah. If so, the environment is still safe. But if they directly um, dispose the waste to the river, it means that the environment will decrease their quality and it will make the fish population will disappear from the uh, river ecosystem. And the right side is the long droughts cause also the fish to lose their habitat. So that is the population decrease dramatically. This is uh, uh, occurred in Yogyakarta during the long dry seasons. Yeah. Mostly river will uh, dry and no uh, aquatic organisms. Next about the human intervention in framework versus ecosystem by uh, dispose of the garbage. Yeah. Solid and liquid waste, agriculture waste, household and laundry waste, cause pollution and eutrophication. From the laundry, it will make uh, eutrophication, while from the industry, usually makes pollution. pollution yeah. This is will make the fish population in the river ecosystem will decrease dramatically. Yeah. Next, about the how to uh, increase the population. Yeah. So fish conservation is an effort to protect pre and to preserve and utilize fish. Fish conservation can be done in two ways, namely in situ conservation and ex situ conservation. Let's move for the talk uh, about the in situ conservation. In situ conservation is the conservation of place or conservation of genetic resource in natural fish population. For example, protection of the spawning ground and the nursery grounds. In this photograph, I show you my research that uh, in the uh, upper part of the Sirmo Reservoir here, that uh, at the time we mix uh, the ditch of the uh, river set, uh, river sites here, dig digging this area by two uh, by two to one meters. This means that. Um, this area is uh, provided for fish to spawn. Mostly is from uh, Argeria Terunia, or we call uh, water pari fish. They will spawn here, they will spawn, and their progeny uh, or the larva will go to the Sermo uh, Reservoir and grow up there. So if we imagine that every river here provide for the spawning site for the fish species, so the popula population of the fish and reservoir here will increase or still high. Yeah. Yeah. Next, about an ex situ conservation is uh, preservation place are used to protect living things from dirt uh, threat of extinctions. Ex situ conservation can be done by creating shelters and spawning ground outside their habitat. Uh, juvenile resulted from spawning, then are uh, used for restocking. That's this photograph I show you 
about the restocking of uh, cipriniferes. Uh, here, uh, my colleagues from uh, the faculty, from biochemistry faculty, have already spawn of uh, some, uh, this species, and this species released to the environment system or uh, in the river and the into uh, released to uh, introduce to the embung we call embung is a reservoir and so on. So this is another um, way how to increase the population in of fish in the environment system. Next about the protection of fish species can be carried out using uh, some ways, including reducing a predator, we will call it the predator species or invasive species, inter introducing rare species, providing natural food, and lowering competitors. And here about the reduction of predator fish or competitor fish. And the right side, I told, uh, call you that uh, farm uh, fishermen catch uh, red devil using kill net with a uh, mass size is two inches. It means that if we want to collect a red devil feces, we can use a kill net with two inches. While if we want to collect the tilapia species, is recommended using kill net in, uh, with mass size three inches. So by doing so, that the population of red devil will decrease. However, this problem is how to uh, overcome the high population in reserve, uh, reservoir is the high population of red devil, they grow uh, and reproduce very rapidly. So the fishing of red devil cannot uh, overcome the population of red devil. Maybe uh, will the other way you saying likes the small person, maybe they can uh, reduce the population of red devil. This is one way. And another way is uh, for the how to de uh, to decrease the carnivore fish using fishing. Yeah, using fishing that, uh, for example, for the snakehead fish uh, to uh, to catch the snakehead using. Uh, it can be used the uh, fish uh, roots yeah? uh, using a bite from the frog or the organism that can uh, run in the water and that it will attract to the uh, snake head to eat the the hope yeah okay next is maybe <clears throat> introduce the res res species yeah? it the of fish species in water is intended to increase the fish population, also to increase the fish species, or to take advantage for the empty species, uh, empty fish species. So, in, at the end 2020, uh, the Department of Fisheries and Marine Affairs of Yogyakarta introduced uh, silver raspora, bony lip barbs, dolphin barbs in super public water. Such, uh, such as uh, rivers, dam, uh, well spring, uh, we call also mbung. In the, this photograph, I'll show you how uh, the um, government uh, uh, and some, <coughs> fish, some fishermen release some species, yeah, some species in the, into the uh, river ecosystem or in the uh, mbung or other water bodies. Yeah. <clears throat> introduction, uh, in introduction uh, introduce the fish species. We hope that the fish can grow in the uh, river ecosystem. Then it will can uh, reproduce, yeah. reproduce, and we hope the population still uh, high and the community of fishermen can collect this fish in during this time. Yeah. Next. <clears throat> Uh, this is my research. Uh, how to utilize uh, empty feed uh, needs in the uh, water ecosystem. Yeah. The domain 
of invasive species cause fish species to be unable to utilize feed or plankton. Weak growth abundantly. The introduction of fish species from outside is expected to use and to control the growth of abundant of feed. This I show you in the right side is uh, I've already introduced of um, Chanos Chanos, we call in Bahasa Espandeng, in Sermo Reservoir. Why I use uh, Chanos Chanos? Because this species or uh, this species, um, phytoplankton, so I hope that the Chanos Chanos can eat uh, plankton, uh, plankton that grow in this reservoir. <clears throat> and this I introduced during uh, April, uh, during April, in the upper one, the length is around five to eight centimeter. And the bottom one, after eight months, uh, uh, around, yeah, after six months, this is in October. October that we sampling here in the left, in the middle bottom here, that, that we were sampling, get the Chanos Chanos, uh, the length around 28 centimeters and the weight around 130 grams. So it's been that one kilo around uh, eight species, uh, eight individuals. And this Kenos uh, Kenos collect by fishermen. Then they sell to the, uh, we call it here as Arong, on the small restaurant, that's around there, yeah. And the this species, the price is around 30,000 rupiahs. It means that compared to other, tilap, uh, other species, the tilapia, the price around 30, 000, uh, around 15,000 ru uh, rupiahs. So the price of canos uh, canos is twice compared to, uh, and the left one, this is, uh, I have photographed here that the sell when this is around 10,000 rupiahs, that is mean uh, by, by introducing of canos uh, canos into the reservoir, the the fisher, uh, the uh, community will get affected by from the fishing, shelling fish, and other arti activities set set us shut us for rec uh, recre recreation. Yeah. So this is very uh, interesting. Some species that can be utilized by uh, community. However, this the this affected introducing of canos canos is because this species cannot um, reproduce in the freshwater system. So we should introduce every time to the uh, re uh, uh, river system or reservoir system. And <clears throat> Uh, this is the end of my presentation. Thank you for your attention and stay healthy. And I stop my and uh, time I return back to you. Thank you very much to all of uh, participants and distinguished guests. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jumanto, for the presentation. It is very, very impressive and comprehensive uh, from the how to do uh, basic research in uh, species of uh, fish and also how to uh, resolve uh, some of the uh, biodiversity of the fish in uh, Yogyakarta. So the next is uh, Ibu Puji Prihanti Ningse, but I, I don't have the CV from Ibu uh, Puji uh, because you know that Good day. I, I mean, Anga, the moderator is uh, cannot connect properly now. Maybe Masrija, do you have uh, the TV? Yes, I yes, do. Yes, okay. Please read the TV of uh, Bupuji. Yes, sure. All right. Uh, Ms. Puji Priyantiningse is a researcher at the 
Karimun Jawa National Park. And she got her bachelor degree in medicine science from the Diponegoro University. And then she continued her master degree in the area of management at the University of James Cook, Australia. So she is now responsible for the uh, management of the conservation of the Karimun Jawa National Park. I think that is a short biography of uh, Ms. Puji, uh, Mr. Alim. So I think uh, Ms. Puji, uh, the stage is yours and you can present your results. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear my voice? Yes. Yes, okay. properly. Okay. I would like to share my presentation. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Puji Prihatiningsi. I'm working for Karimun Jawa National Park. And before uh, starting the presentation, I would like to thank uh, the Department of History Science, University of Gajah Mada for giving us the opportunity to share our experiences here. Um, so basically, uh, I would like to share what we have done in, in Karimun Jawa National Park. And basically the presentation will be very simple. It will be divided into three parts. The first part is about the context of Karimun Jawa National Park itself. Uh, in case maybe you haven't got any chance to visit uh, the park. And then the second one, a glimpse about the management and the last one about the challenges that we are facing at the moment. So um, we all know that Indonesia is an archipelagic country and we all know also the fact that we have the longest coastline, we are the uh, mega biodiversity hotspots in the world. And related with the marine protected area, uh, at the moment we have about 20, 20, 20 million hectares of marine protected area. Those uh, MPA are managed currently by two agencies. The first one is uh, Ministry of Environment and Forestry, managing around 5.3 million hectares of MPA. And the rest of the area, about uh, 15 million hectares of MPA, are currently managing by the Ministry of Marine Affairs. I think there are 10 uh, marine reserves and marine national parks in uh, many are managed by the uh, Ministry of Marine Affairs at the moment. So um, our agency is under the Ministry of Environment and uh, Forestry. So from the number of 5.3 million, uh, it is uh, located in seven marine national parks. So the first one here is the uh, Kapolawan Seribu National Park. And then this is in the circle is the Karmunjawa National Park and the other is uh, Bunake National Park in North Sulawesi and Takabonerate in South Sulawesi. And then um, Wakatobi National Park is at the Southeast Sulawesi. And then I think it's around here, Togean National Park in the Central Sulawesi. And the last one uh, is the uh, Teluk Cendrawasi National Park in West Papua. So, um, we go to Karimun Jawa now. Uh, so um, Karimun Jawa is not really far away actually from Yogyakarta. So Yogyakarta is around here under Magelang. So um, Karimun Jawa is about 90 nautical miles from Jepara. So the park can be accessed by flights and boats for sure. But during this pandemic time, uh, the park only can be accessed uh, using boats. The, slow boat ferry, and also the fast boat uh, from the port of Jepara. And uh, the area here are the location of the uh, Karimun Jawa National Park. So the area in this uh, red box 
is the area of the national park covering an area of 111 thousands hectares and 625 hectares uh, of uh, areas it consists of uh, we don't have not only we not only marine area but also we we have like 1200 hectares of uh, the tropical rainforest and also about 200 hectares of mangroves here in below in the island of Kemujan in the top here and the lowland tropical rainforest is the one in the uh, dark green. So this is the short profile of the Garimunjawa National Park. Um, it has five ecosystems ranging from the top is the uh, lowland tropical rainforest and then if you, you go down you will find the uh, mangrove forest and also the coastal ecosystem and then you can jump to the water and you will find the coral reef ecosystem and also the seagrass ecosystem due to the uh, relatively pristine and good condition um, we can proudly proclaim that uh, Kanemunjawa National Park is the representative of the northern coast of Java and it also uh, a playground for the researchers and students from all across Indonesia to do research and educational activities and in this area. And it also already been declared as a, one of the main uh, tourist destination in Central Java province alongside with the Borobudur, Sangiran and Dieng. However, if you can see at the map here, you can see the uh, gray area here It's actually the location where uh, people are living in this area. It's about uh, 10,000 people living in this area. The area of the archipelago of Karimunjawa was under one district, the district of Karimunjawa. And there are four villages, the villages of Karimunjawa, the villages of Parang, uh, the villages of Kamujan. And this is the further, much further, the villages of Parang and the villages of the Nyamuk, the smallest uh, inhabited island. And uh, just like any other uh, any other uh, coastline area, most of the people in Karimun Jawa work as a uh, fisherman. So this is also the profile of the ecosystem that we are having in the park about the coral reef ecosystem is covering an area of more than 7,000 hectares. It's also a habitat for more than 70 gen genera of uh, corals and hundreds of species of uh, fish, reef fish actually. And then about the mangrove, it's covering uh, an area of about uh, 400 hectares and there are 45 species of the mangroves and some of the species can be categorized as uh, rare species. And the, la uh, the next one is the uh, lowland tropical rainforest ecosystem. It's also a habitat for hundreds of species of flora and fauna. And most importantly, uh, the forest plays uh, a role in as a life supporting system for the people's local for the people's living in the park surrounding because it provides uh, fresh water for the uh, for the people. And this is the coastal ecosystem and also the seagrass ecosystem. Um, we have nine species of seagrass in, uh, in the area. So uh, this is the definition of a national park based on the, uh, the law, the law number five, the year of 1990, uh, conservation of natural resources and ecosystems. So basically, the national park can be defined as a naturally conserved area that have pristine ecosystem. Pristine ecosystem is a must. And then uh, for the management, it should be based on a zoning system and it, and it can be function or used as a, for the purpose of research, education, mariculture, and ecotourism. So as we, as we read the definition, uh, zoning is uh, mandatory for the management of, of the park of the protected area. And here in Karimun Jawa, we have nine zones at the moment. Uh, you can find the different type of the zones based on the color. 
for example, the red one is the uh, the core zones, and the red uh, the, the green one is the tourism zones. The blue one is the protection zones, and the light green one is the medical zones. And uh, most of the area are the uh, traditional utilization zones. Basically, all the zone have its own uh, designations. Uh, so it has rules what activities that can be done in 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 each uh, in each zones. Mm, why? the traditional utilization zones uh, has the most area of the park because basically um, directly it's an acknowledgement of the of the livelihood of the people who has been living in the area long before the establishment of the park the people of karimun jawa has been using the area as a fishing ground for their livelihood from from de for decades for many maybe many centuries because the latest publication uh, about Karimun Jawa can be found during the era of Majapahit or uh, even uh, older. So um, yes, uh, for the tourism zones, it's only for uh, tourism activities and basically for the protection and the uh, core zone basically it can be, can be seen as the no take zone basically activity that can be conducted in those zones are the for the research education and also the uh, limited uh, protection activity so uh, this is the basic formulas for basic formulas for the management of a protected area it also can be uh, read uh, from the from the law i think law number five of the year of 1990 so uh, the formula is uh, is clear because the management of protected area should be uh, based on three main pillars. The first pillar is protection, and the second one is conservation. The third one is but the sustainable utilization. So by doing so, it is hoped that um, the ecological function of the ecosystem will be preserved. At the same time, also will promote the uh, economic welfare and also the social and cultural welfare of the locals. However, this management cannot stand alone. I mean, uh, it also needs stakeholder support coming from the central government, the provincial government, the local government, the uh, regency government, from the academics, uh, from the uh, NGOs, and uh, from the community, for sure. Uh, related with this, uh, with the stakeholder improve uh, impro, uh, stakeholder involvement for the management, uh, recently the president has declared a presidential regulation number fifty six, the year two thousand nineteen, about a national action plan on the integrated management of the MPA generally. So within the document, you can find that. Um, the management of MPAs in Indonesia, both managed by the Ministry of Environment and Forestry and Ministry of Marine Affairs, are not so are not only the responsibility of the related ministry, but also the responsibility of other agencies. And you can list it. Many agencies should be uh, linked and so be involved for the management. Um, related with the these three pillars, uh, protection, conservation, and sustainable utilization, it can be break down into several activities and programs. So for example, uh, for the protection pillars, you will have, we will have like uh, patrolling in, in terrestrial, also patrolling in, 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 in the marine area, and also um, law enforcement activities. Meanwhile, for the conservation area, basically that's what I'm doing as like mentioned by uh, Pak Riza that uh, we're doing like a, a monitoring of the resources and also we're also doing the evaluation and also analyzing about the uh, resources uh, data. Regarding with sustainable utilization, uh, still based on the regulation, we are promoting and supporting for the uh, sustainable utilization such as uh, ecotourism and then uh, community empowerment and and other programs that can uh, reduce the uh, threats to the uh, 
protected area or the national park by keeping the locals uh, uh, empowerment activities. So um, the next one is about the history of the zoning uh, of the national park itself. You can see that it was uh, it was proposed basically from the uh, the governor of Central Java Province and then got approved in 1982 and then go further to uh, 2020. Until now, we are having uh, we already having uh, zoning review uh, two times. And at the moment, we are reviewing and evaluating the current zones, as uh, I mentioned before. So um, whether or not we are doing a review about the ongoing zones, um, we will we'll see in the coming year. So the next part is about the challenges. Um, just like any other MPAs in the world, I think we are also facing the impact of uh, climate change, just like pa Jumanto also mentioning earlier. Um, as well as also the local issues related to the utilization of the resources within the area coming from the activity of tourism and fisheries and also the degradation of uh, water quality. Um, related with the climate change, uh, the park all, already experienced uh, some bleaching events and the recent one was occurring on 2016, as you can see here. If you compare the coral cover from 2013, it, it drops the coral cover due to bleaching. However, uh, it, it is slightly increasing. It is slightly increasing in 2019. So it proves that the coral reef ecosystem can bounce back to the, uh, to the bleaching, to bleaching moment, bleaching impact. However, we're not sure if this uh, scenario of the climate change will be more frequent or, and we will see more bleaching even. Uh, we're not sure, or we don't really know whether this uh, coral reef ecosystem will be resilient or have the immunity to fight back to the, uh, to the stressor, just like what we have now with the coronavirus, I guess. So um, regarding with the local issues uh, about the marine tourism, um, as I mentioned before, Karimun Jawa is one of the uh, tourist destination in, in Central Java and also in Indonesia. So uh, from the top graph, you will see that uh, there was a trend that the number of tourists coming to the park was growing from year to year. Uh, the data was taken from the Tourist Information Center in Jepara. Meanwhile, if you look at the graph on the bottom, based on our monitoring data from 2012 to 2019, for the reef cover in the tourism zone here, it shows uh, a decrease, a decrease from the year of 2013 to the year of 2019. So um, we can indicate that this uh, that the decrease of the coral cover can be caused by the, by this uh, tourism activities uh, in this in this zone area in the zones. So it could be coming from in the coming from from the uh, snorkeling area because most of the people coming to Karimunja will go hop and off island and then they go swimming snorkeling. And also maybe coming from some of the boat anchoring, and also we also found uh, garbage in the in the water. So uh, the next issue, local issue, will be a fisheries issue. As I mentioned before, the coral reef in Karimun Java was habitat for uh, four hundred species of reef fish. We're talking really. Uh, mentioning about refis here. Um, actually, based on our monitoring data from 2012 to 2019, we found that uh, the refis abundance are a bit uh, dynamic here. It uh, increased slightly in 2013 and then drops and then 2019 it slightly uh, improved. So uh, 
generally from the last two years, maybe the decrease of the uh, fish abundance in 2016 also related with the with the bleaching or we're not sure about bleaching or the activity happening in the area, but it's uh, slightly improved. However, for the reef fish biomass, our data, our monitoring data uh, shows that there's no improvement. I mean, uh, from the year of 2012 to 2019, the data shows drop from year to year. So um, there's no improvement in, in, in fish biomass. This data uh, suggests that uh, in, in, the, in, in the fish, uh, in the coral reef ecosystems in Karimun Jawa, the fish are dominantly uh, small. And even though the abundance are still, they're still rich in abundance, but the size are small. So where did the uh, big fish go? Um, so, and this is the slides of uh, utilization, fishing, uh, fishing in Karimun Jawa. So um, the area of Karimun Jawa already been a fishing ground for the locals here, people of Karimun Jawa itself in, in the box, in the archipelago, but also become a fishing ground for the people coming from the northern part of Java. I mean, you can name it ranging from uh, Tegal, Batang, Cirebon up to uh, up to, to the east, uh, up to, to the east Pati and then uh, Rembang and etc. They also coming from the coming to the area to fish. Even the Fishermen coming from Java cannot fish within the park because they already uh, in the in the permit documents they are forbidden to fish uh, in in the national park, but they fish around this area. So traditionally there are twenty or uh, twenty fishing grounds around the Karimun Jawa archipelago here. So we are talking about the fishing activity in in the park within this box this circle, this box here. So mostly are the local fishermen coming from Karimun Jawa. And they're using a small boat uh, because they are artisan, artisanal fishers. And because this area are their livelihood. However, it's, it's a bit difficult to find or to measure the fish productivity in, in Karimun Jawa because there's no uh, fishing auction site or in Bahasa, maybe you call it a TPI. So um, it's a bit complicated to uh, quantify the number of fish production in Karibun Jawa because uh, the fishermen uh, here, for example, coming from the village of Parang and Nyamuk, they directly sell uh, the fish to Jepara because the distance to go to Jepara, to Jepara is the same as the distance to go to Karimun Jawa. Basically, they have like a middleman fisherman relationship with people in Jepara. So they sell the fish directly to Jepara. And then in turn, they will have uh, money and also ice and also logistics to go to fishing again and to and money to give to the family, of course. However, um, we, uh, the National Park and also the, our partners, WCS, have developed with, uh, systems to monitoring the, um, quantify the fish production, fish productivity in, in Karimun Jawa, especially Karimun Jawa here by developing a fish landing uh, monitoring. Basically, we go to the uh, middleman, middleman in Karimun Jawa here. There are several middlemen and we try to quantify the species, the uh, the weight, also the long of the fish, uh, of the fish catch that uh, fishermen give to the uh, to the local middlemen here. So it had been conducted for more than ten years, and and hopefully this data can be used to reflect the uh, fish productivity in Karimun Jawa. Due to the uh, to answer the uh, data deficiencies in 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 this archipelago, 
So uh, about the fish productivity, mostly dominated by the uh, family of Cassiopeidae, or you can uh, call it a uh, yellowfin fusilier, or in Indonesian it will be uh, ikan ekor kuning, dominated by ikan ekor kuning uh, uh, for the reef fish fisheries, and then followed by other uh, species. However, recent uh, recent data uh, from the our monitoring, fish landing monitoring, shows that this uh, yellowfin fish is overfished. The condition is overfished at the moment, even though uh, the catch per unit effort is relatively stable, even a bit, re uh, even reduced in some point. So um, we are uh, suggesting that. Uh, this condition forced the fishers to find another fishing ground and they go further, not only in the national park, area, national park area, but also to go further. They start to use, uh, in, especially in, in here, the village of Parang and, the, and, and Yamuk, they start to using uh, gadget, fancy gadget like fish sounders and everything and solar panels and everything to, to go fish further. Uh, related with this fishing management is a bit uh, for our agency is a bit um, a bit dilemma or or there's in my opinion it will be there will be a hesitation for my management to my office or to uh, really regulate or manage the fishing area here because simply there's no uh, legal standing on on these issues. However. There are some local initiatives that we are uh, support related with the fisheries. For example, like in uh, in the district of Karimunjawa and the old villages, the people agreed to uh, develop the local wisdom. Uh, they develop uh, rules, uh, village rules, and also kecamatan rules, district rules to uh, regulate uh, the fishing of uh, groupers. It, it's been running and it's still running and and we're supporting it because it will also at the same point reduce the the threats to the uh, to the national park area and the last issues will be related with the water qualities we just recently found this issue together with uh with uh, researchers coming from the australia and they found that there are a massive abundance of uh, sponges in few area in, in some area of the park and at the same point our monitoring also shows uh, the occurrence of coral disease uh, dominantly white syndrome disease in forested species the species of coral reef in some area of the uh, national park especially an area that are relatively relatively close with the uh, people settlements the development of this research was conducted and is uh, indicate there's indication that this uh, reduction or degradation of water quality uh, develops at the same time when the stream ponds also being built in two main islands of Karimunjawa. I mean the Karimunjawa island also this uh, the uh, Kemujan islands. At least there are uh, 11 uh, stream ponds at the moment and they start building it in 2016 and we start the monitoring on 2017 and 18. So um, we still look forward and to study about the correlation between these two, two phenomena and hoping that um, these issues will be started to uh, address in the, in the coming years. So I want I won't make any conclusion. <laughs> I won't make any conclusion, but I would like to share to all of you that in in the field level, just like what we are doing uh, in the, in Karimunjawa, that it's often well, we found that uh, conservation and economy are being challenged with each other. We are like uh, facing, uh, we're like uh, fighting each other. I mean, and it's uh, I personally think that uh, management is an art to keep the scale balanced, even though it's difficult, of course, between conservation and economy and, and 
the paradigm that should, should be built is the sustainability and how we can build sustainability and how we can suggest uh, the science and stockholder commitments to uh, to contribute in the in the paradigm of sustainability is is I think is very important and I think it's the role of uh, the academics, uh, your the students, and also the public, uh, the public, and also the local community to 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 give contribution to the to the effort of conservation as well as the improvement of the uh, community welfare in in the area of protected area. I think that's all. Thank you for the time. And back to you, Bapa. Thank you, uh, Ms. Puji, for your interesting presentation. Uh, due to the difficulty of, of the moderator, I mean, he has uh, difficulty in getting the signal, so I will be the moderator for the next session that is Q&A session. So uh, there are four questions actually for Dr. Alita, but she already answered three of them, I think. And uh, all, or you, you already uh, answered all of the questions, Dr. Alita? Or you would like to some explanation or elaboration maybe? Oh, I think, uh, well, unless uh, there's a follow-up to those other three, maybe they're enough. Um, but I, I missed, uh, I haven't answered yet the, actually, I think I saw just this one question from uh, the chat that I haven't answered yet. Maybe yes. I can answer that, yeah. Um, so the question is uh, from, I'm sorry, not sure if I pronounced this properly, Chut Dohan uh, from- Yes, uh, yes. yes. So, yes. Dohan. <laughs> and um, so, Questions are beside uh, detecting HABs, what are the kind of other mitigations that can be developed to overcome HABs? Uh, number two, what causes HABs? Number three, through the sensors, can we detect the kinds of species of phytoplankton which cause HABs? Okay, so um, uh, let me start with um, maybe the <laughs> third question, which is the easier, easiest to answer. Uh, straightforward, no. Those sensors that I showed you, um, where it's just uh, it's physical uh, parameters in chlorophyll, so and it can dis differentiate any hub species. So um, you have to have um, uh, more validation from uh, cell monitoring and. Uh, or toxin monitoring to 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 ensure that and then train the model and then validate and uh, deploy that. And uh, number two, what causes HAB? So so as I mentioned, the um, main causative organisms of HABs are uh, these uh, toxic phytoplankton for the toxic kind of blooms. They they're most of them are dinoflagellates. Um, only a few, like only yeah, very few are diatoms. Uh, and um, a lot, um, there's also um, many different diatoms and dinoflagellates that can cause fish gills. So for the fish gills, it's a different process where if there's a large bloom of these phytoplankton, um, eventually they'll de decompose. So that uses up the oxygen in the water and that can uh, uh, that affects now the um, uh, the fish and other oxygens uh, other organisms that need oxygen in the water column, especially those that can move um, or move away from the oxygen depleted area. Uh, the first question is um, besides detecting hubs, what kind of other mitigations um, can be developed to overcome? Well. Um, uh, other countries actually have uh, used mitigation measures like clay. So they, they, um, they like Korea and I think Japan, they, they um, deploy clay uh, sediments that essentially they bring down or either 
bring down or even kill the, the blooms when there's a large bloom. Um, they deploy that in a controlled manner in specific areas. But of course, you know, there has to be a lot of study in where you deploy that, what material you use to make sure that um, that, that is not uh, harmful to the ecosystem itself, right? And that's difficult for us because, for example, in our, many of our areas, we have coral reefs, seagrass as, as well, habit, coastal habitats that would be sensitive to um, clay deployment or sediment deployment. Uh, so those are, um, I think that's one of the um, main uh, technologies for mitigation that's used in other countries. Uh, but apart from that, a lot is really, many countries use detection methods and early warning systems for, um, for HABs, um, mitigating the effect of HABs. Thank you. Thank you. I think there is a question for Dr. Jumanto from uh, Mr. Iso Igo Selpi Anas. Dr. Jumanto, have you read the questions already? Not yet, sorry. Uh, I don't yeah, read. Yeah, I will read. Yeah, yes, yeah. The question is, why are the diversity index and the number of species between upper, middle, and lower areas are different in opaque watershed. What is the causes? Is that only? Um, yeah, uh, that's caused by the environment that this species mostly stay in the water with uh, uh, water Clarity, water clarity very high, clean, high oxygen, and love of food. But the important is about the water quality is very high oxygen, then very clear. And compared to the lower one, the lower one is a very uh, limited area that this fish can uh, get this uh, environment. So that's the reason is about the environment condition. Thank you for the answer, uh, Dr. Jumanto. And there is also a question for Ms. Puji. Have you read the question, Puji? Yes, I have read it. Um, it's from Pak Sigit Prasetya. Is yes. It? Yes. Yeah. Okay, I will directly answer. Oh, it's Pak Sigit. Actually, uh, this is uh, two authorities of uh, different ministries, I guess. Um, so, Ministry of Environment and Forestry is uh, which, uh, in, in this case, is Karimun Jawa National Park works to protect or the, uh, the seascape. However, we don't have a legal standing or legal basis to do the fisheries management. So, generally speaking, we're 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 managing the uh, ecosystem. We're managing the um, we're managing the um, what do you call it um, uh, the kitchen of this. Uh, if you if you look at it, the northern part of Java, it's the uh, Java Sea. It's it's so wide area and Karimunjau National Park lies in the middle. We are the kitchen. It's in, if what happened in the kitchen in, in, in the house is like you have food, you store food. So we are become the kitchen of the, uh, the kitchen or the uh, feed sources of the, of the, of the uh, Java Sea, of the northern coast of Java. However, we don't have, like I said previously, we don't have the lake of standing to manage the fisheries. However, we understand that um, Ministries of uh, Marine Affairs also have developed uh, fishing areas, WPP 7122 for uh, northern coast of Java. And I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, they're in a poor condition or overfish condition. And now it's also uh, the symptoms of overfishing also starting, uh, it's starting occurring in, in within the, within, within, within the, the protected area. So, um, Regarding with what you're saying about the um, 
evaluation of effectiveness. Yes, we have been using this tool, but basically the um, met, uh, methods are used for the uh, for the evaluation and for the uh, scoring of our own uh, management. So uh, Karimun Jawa, for example, should be scored under 70. If you are not under 70, then it means that your management is poor, then you need to do some series of regulation, blah, 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 blah. And so far we are uh, doing this uh, evaluation together with the, with the stakeholders. And we've done uh, the last one, I think two years, two years ago, 2020, the early 2020. However, yes, it's, it's a pity that we don't have, uh, we don't have to direct uh, involvement in the fisheries issue, but if you come and visit Karimun Jawa, you will find a small Indonesia because all agencies are in Karimun Jawa, starting from a Ministry of Forestry, Ministry of Marine Affairs, and then the Navy and everything. I, I think they have their own representative in Karimun Jawa. So there should be a division or uh, what you are doing and what we are doing, but also we are communicating with this all agencies. I think that's all. Master Riza, thank you. Thank you so much, Bubuji. Uh, I think we will accept last question from the audience. So I saw a raised hand by Ms. Christina Ratnara Handayani. I will give you an opportunity to ask directly to the speakers. So Christina, still mute? Hello, Bu Christina. She's not there, maybe. Okay, so I will open one last question to the audience, to the participants. Do you have any questions to all of the speakers? If you have a question, please raise a hand. I think there are further, there are no more questions. Oh, I with a second, please. Yeah, the last questions um, will be given to Dr. Jumanto. This is a question from uh, Ibu Jut Johan. She asked about um, the effect of Merapi eruption. Um, how does it affect the species abundance? And she suggests that the abundance of species is more threatened by electricity fishing and also in passive species compared to the eruptions. Okay, Ajumanto, do you have any comments on that, please? <clears throat> okay, thank you, Ibu Jud. Good evening, Ibu Jud. Uh, very interesting question. Yeah, uh, that I have mentioned uh, the effect of eruption, uh, eruption of Merapi. This uh, directly, of course, burn the fish. Yeah. Uh, so that uh, fish feces in the upper area mostly disappear because this burned by uh, uh, stone and uh, lava, yeah, lava. And however, after a little bit, a few months maybe, a few months the river already uh, because the sand uh, collect by uh, <clears throat> collect for the uh, the purpose so it means that the river will uh, discover uh, that means uh, the river will uh, recover then uh, this starting fish may be from other connectivity of the river will goes to the upper area and stay there this for the second one the effect of the fishermen that use electricity 
the effect is will continue because they are uh, used every time, not only one time, not one month, not one day, but every time, maybe uh, some months or and so on. So both the effect of the unfriendly uh, facing gear with um, introduction of uh, invasive species the effect is uh, very long and this will decrease will mix the so the effect of fishing gear that unfriendly and introduction of invasive uh, species most uh, dangerous uh most longer compare effect of the uh, merapi eruption uh, this the decreasing of fish population that may be because uh, I have not uh, yet done the research comparison of this. Yeah, maybe the effect of uh, fishing gear and uh, friendly and introduction and uh, species, invasive species, is uh, maybe bigger or maybe dangerous compared to um, rapid eruption. This, this all. Thank you. All right, thank you, Pak Jumanto. Dear speakers and participants, I think this is the end of the sixth Syntec webinar. On the behalf of the Department of Fisheries Faculty of Agriculture, we would like to express our gratitude to all of the speakers and all of the participants that have uh, participated in these sessions. And before we close this session or this webinar, we would like to take a picture with all of the speakers. And yeah, so. Wait a second, please. Okay, so I will. Please, Kede, beside the Dukan camera, can you please turn on your camera? Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm so sorry because uh, bad connection before. Yeah. No problem. I already took your responsibility. <laughs> okay. You. One, two, three. Yeah. Okay. Smile. Okay. Uh, before I close this webinar, do you have any message or any? words to, or any comments to convey, uh, Pak Alin? No, uh, I think it's uh, complete. Thank you, Mr. No, I asked to Pak Alin. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Riza. Uh, I have uh, to, to channel now because uh, also there is some uh, meeting, so... Uh, <laughs> So uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Aleta, uh, also uh, Ibu Buci, uh, Master of Applied Science, and so Dr. Jumanto. It is uh, very, very nice to meet you. And uh, we already share uh, many, many information, and also some experience in the uh, conservation of uh, marine and fishery science. And it is very uh, invaluable uh, science for our uh, community and especially also for our, our student. And uh, finally, thank you. And uh, maybe we will also uh, invite you in the next time to more discussion about the fisheries and uh, marine science. Thank, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks again, uh, Aleta, Mbak Puji, Pak Jumanto. And thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pali, Pak Jumanto, Dr. Aleta, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you all of the participants. And the certificate will be announced and will uh, be able to uh, download uh, by a link that will be announced to uh, all of the participants via the uh, personal email. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. Okay. Bye bye. See you next time. See you. See you. <laughs>
Stay healthy. Okay, okay. Thank you very much.